you're part of the EMT response in Central Park. Just a quick snapshot of that of that work that you do in Central Park and how it's, it's changed with the park becoming a hospital, essentially. So, yes, um, we have the Central Park Medical Units, a volunteer ambulance service that operates, for the most part, strictly within Central Park. Um, Central Park is visited by 42 million uh, visitors every year, so it's a huge amount. And when you have uh, that number of visitors or that number of people, um, things will happen. You know, a lot of people playing sports, a lot of people riding bikes, um, people will have heart attacks, they get sick, they fall off their bikes. Um, so there's really a need to have a frontline emergency medical service where people are very familiar with uh, locations in the park, whereas at times um, the outside EMS agencies who, who are around the park really don't know exactly where to go when you say, listen, I'm at the fountain, I'm at the Cherry Hill, I'm at the Alaska Ring, um, and that doesn't com you know, compute well with the city computer systems or the uh, crews from the outside the park. So we know the park inside and out. So um, right now, a lot of people who are told to stay indoors still need to go outside and exercise. And you know, one of the places they go is Central Park. Central Park is still pretty busy right now. And, and you would say to yourself, well, it should be empty. I mean, if you look at Times Square, Times Square looks like a ghost town. But Central Park is still pretty populated uh, during the day because people are climbing the walls in their apartments and they go out for a little recreation, a little exercise. So, you know, we're still covering the park. And um, sadly, you know, a lot of people are getting sick from this uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. And the city, um, you know, it's, it's been an upward spiral of cases. Um, and the normal volume in New York City for uh, ambulance cases is in the area of the low 4,000s. That's been going up steadily, and uh, we're now past 7,000. I think like two days ago it was 7,200. And that's putting a vast strain on our resources. So um, we have been asked to you know, help the city's fire department, EMS. Uh, they put out a call for mutual aid. Uh, and we are covering with them um, the rest of the city in addition to covering Central Park. So we have gone outside of the park. We're covering, um, you know, everywhere. We've gone out to uh, uptown Manhattan. We've gone out to the Bronx. Uh, we're going just about everywhere because um, the resources are stretched pretty thin. And I just understood today that FEMA has requested get more ambulance services from out of state to come into New York to help. Um, not so much with the 911 calls, but with the transports from out of the hospitals to uh, places like the Navy ship and the Javits Center. And um, I'm, I'm not really sure how they're gonna get people into the Central Park Hospital either, but maybe with that as well. And are those hospitals, the Navy ship and Javits Center and Central Park starting to fill up with patients? So I think the Central Park Hospital is not yet open. It should be open in a day or two. And I can't really tell you about the Javits Center. I don't think they're ready yet either. I think they're gearing up. I think we're supposed to peak here in New York City in about um, a week, 10 days, uh, maybe two weeks, closer to 10 days to two weeks in terms of patient loads. Um, I'll tell you, it's very sad when you go into an emergency room. And, and you know, if you're not really sick, um, if you're in a panic mode, you should really stay away from the emergency rooms. It's not the place to go unless you are sick. Mind you, if you are sick, if you have a fever, if you uh, have trouble breathing, you need to call 911 before it's too late. You don't want to wait uh, on something like that. But at the, on the other side of the token, you know, if you're just having general malaise or if you have anxiety, you shouldn't be calling 911 because you're straining the resources even further and you really don't want to end up going to the emergency room where there are lots and lots of very sick people. And if you're not sick and you go there, the chances are you might get sick. And are there some hospitals that are less stressed than others or is it true of every hospital in the New York metro area? 
Well, I can't really say in terms of, you know, I haven't seen every hospital, so I, I can't tell you firsthand. I, I can tell you of the hospitals that we hear from, they're all pretty stressed. Um, you know, it, it's pretty sad when you think about, um, and, and, you know, we are hearing that every hospital has now from the city of New York a tractor trailer, which is those huge trailers, um, refrigerated trailers for storage of dead bodies. Now, that's a scary thought. And, you know, from what I understand, those trailers are being filled. So, you know, they're being taken away and, and replaced with new empty trailers. So I think that's kind of an inkling that, you know, things are bad here and they're bad everywhere. And, you know, slowly but surely, the city of New York has been decreasing in the number of hospitals over a number of years. And of course, there are a number of different causes for that. You know, some people say it's the Medicaid uh, spending has forced some hospitals to close. So it's financial uh, stress on the system. And yes, there have been a number of hospitals to close, and I really don't want to get into the reasons for them closing, but we don't have the number of hospital beds that we used to have 20 years ago. Yeah. So as a result, yes, we are stressed here in the city of New York, and I would assume the rest of the state as well. So you had said that the frequency of the ambulance trips are now, there's 45 minute waits for EMT response and they've changed the staffing levels. Can you say something about that? So, um, you know, yes, uh, to, to some degree that, that's very true. What, what is happening is that um, sadly the EMS crews are overworked. They too are getting sick. Um, and when they get sick, you know, they have to stay home because they're contagious. So there is a shortage of paramedics. There is a shortage of EMTs. And in New York City, the ambulance crews, you know, are two tiered. They have a paramedic ambulance and they have a basic life support, which is an EMT ambulance. The paramedic ambulances are staffed by two paramedics. And that's the way we have paramedic ambulances. The basic life support ambulances are staffed by two EMTs. So because of the shortages, um, the staffing has changed. And we now have one paramedic and one EMT. And on the basic life support, we have one certified first responder and one EMT on those ambulances. So yes, uh, you know, in the back where we used to have two paramedics giving care, we now have one paramedic. And the same, you know, as far as the basic life support, we have one EMT giving care as opposed to two. And so as a person with a lot of experience in an ambulance with your coworkers, is that sufficient? Does that concern you? Well, you know, obviously uh, we run under ideal situations in terms of the larger view. Um, and, and two paramedics is always great. And when you have a very serious case, um, yes two paramedics is needed. And when you only have one, you know, you have to make do with what you have. That's the rule that we go by. Um, with Central Park Medical Unit, we are still running with uh, two EMTs. So we are not changing our guidelines. Because fortunately, we have a small army of uh, EMTs and volunteers that we can do that. Um, we are also a teaching unit. So, you know, a lot of our members come to us to gain experience. And as a result, sometimes we run um, two or three members. Uh, we try to cut down during this situation of uh, COVID-19 virus. So we try to run just two EMTs at a time as opposed to normally where we run three, sometimes even four, so that our younger, newer members can gain experience. But we really don't want to expose them to uh, the virus. So we're, we try to cut down the numbers. But we have at least two EMTs at minimum staffing our ambulances still. So what's the mood in the city? You have two, two hats. One is the Central Park Medical Unit. You also have your own business. You're working with customers. What's the mood of the city? So, you know, as I said before, New York City is a ghost town. A lot of people are very scared, rightfully so. And then you have those that are fairly lackadaisical, you know, you have uh, a lot of young people who um, throw caution to the wind. And, you know, it's, it's very hard to explain reason to them and say, listen, you need to keep your distance. 
you don't really understand what happens when you don't keep your distance. And where do you see a lot of a lot of these folks? Uh, you see them on buses and especially subways. So the MTA, which is Metropolitan Transportation uh, Authority, has cut down on the number of subways uh, being run. So they're running less frequently. And as a result, there are more people in them. So of course, if you go to YouTube and, and you you know look at the recent subway runs, you'll see a lot more people on a subway. And of course, they're all over each other. They're very close. There's no such thing as social distancing on these um, subway cars. And as a result, what do you have? You have, you know, all you need is one person who has the virus in there and everybody's going to get it. I mean, yes, some people have gloves on and some people have masks on and good for them. You know, hopefully they won't get it. But there are a lot of people who don't have any protection whatsoever. And guess what? That's really a person at risk. And even if you're young, it's not a good idea. You know, you're going to, that virus goes on your clothes, you go to your office, you go to your home, you spread it around. Terrible, terrible situation. Um, and again, you know, people are still hanging out uh, on the street, um, you know, going to social events, which they should not be doing. You know, you need to use a little more common sense in, in terms of what you're doing in your personal life. Um, I know that most businesses have shut down. A lot of, you know, uh, I would say 90% of the people, uh, if they're still working, they're working from home, which is great. So, you know, you're isolating yourself so that we can just bend this curve all the way down, which is truly necessary. And, and please, I beg of everybody, do not go out, stay home. You know, if you need to go out for a little exercise, that's fine, but keep your distance from other people. If you see a jogger running on the sidewalk, avoid them. Because when they pass by, the sweat's going to dump right onto you, you know, and, and if you're not wearing a mask, uh, you know, all of that sweat's going to go all over you. So if they happen to be contagious, you don't want that anywhere near you. Just please be careful. So, Raphael, you said that you were involved in 9-11. What was the role that you played there? So... Uh, during September 11, sadly, there were quite a number of people who were injured uh, when the buildings came down and even before. Um, I was also involved in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. So during um, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, we brought our ambulance down to BC Street. And as the people were coming down out of the building, um, we parked our ambulance on BC Street and, and they came out. Um, you know, they were all suffering from smoke inhalation. And we put them in the ambulance, gave them oxygen therapy, and brought them um, to the hospital. So it was a big round trip, you know, going back and forth to the hospital, delivering them to the hospital. Uh, and the ambulance was full at that point in time. So um, we had planned on doing the same thing during September 11th and going down to, uh, you know, BC Street. And you know, that morning, when it was election day, uh, as I recall, or something like that. I Maybe it was primary day. don't recall exactly. But I dropped my kids at school, and I got in my car, and I heard over the radio, and I heard uh, a park ranger, actually, and, and I was a park ranger. That's how I met my wife. We were both park rangers. I, I heard her screaming over the radio, which is something I never usually do. Uh, that a plane went into the World Trade Center. And the dispatcher was um, very surprised and said, you mean a small plane? And the, the poor park ranger was hysterical. And once I heard that, I said, something isn't right here uh, because they're not answering. So I went upstairs, I got my uniform, I responded to um, the place where we have our garage, I got the ambulance, and we went to the, um, our station house um, where a crew had gathered, and we had two ambulances at that point. I got one, and we went down Fifth Avenue to the World Trade Center. Um, there was a gentleman who was riding his bike down Fifth Avenue, and when the second plane hit, he had turned around and wasn't looking where he was going. He fell off the bike, and to break his fall, he stuck his hands out, and when he fell, he had an open compound fracture of his arm, so his bones were sticking out of his arm. 
we actually stopped to pick him up. Um, that man saved my life because uh, I would have gone straight down to VC Street and then the buildings would have fallen on me. So I, uh, the man doesn't know that, but I'm very grateful to him because he, he slowed me down enough so that I wouldn't have been there when the buildings fell. Anyway, we took him to the hospital and then we went down to the World Trade Center. And um, by the time we got down there, it was pitch black. It was like it was nighttime, worse than nighttime, because, uh, you know, here in New York City, there's always street lights and you can see something. You can see rather well. At that point in time, you could see nothing. You couldn't see the hand in front of you. It's just really uh, entirely black. So um, staying very close, we were on Broadway at that point in time. Um, near just in front of the World Trade Center, what was the World Trade Center, in total disbelief, uh, gathering some of the, the victims who had managed to crawl away. And we just, you know, again, started our round trips to Bellevue Hospital, uh, removing some of the injured. And we did that uh, mostly all day until about two o'clock when there were no more people who were injured. Everyone had been removed for the most part. And so, you know, that, that's really the sad part. There was no one else to help. Um, and, and I mean that in, in you know, in, in a way that it, it was so strange to us that we couldn't help anyone. Um, you know, everyone else was dead, which we really couldn't fathom. It was so sad to us that we couldn't help anyone. You know, we, were, we were all deeply affected by that. That here we are and we're ready to help them and we couldn't help anybody anymore. It was uh, a terrible feeling. So we went back to the rest of the city. We went uptown where the calls were still coming in. We we're still getting sick and, and I guess there was still a shortage of ambulances. And we helped out there where we could with a regular 911 uh, load of calls. And uh, at some point we you know, went home. I remember finally getting home that evening and. Uh, my kids were, were home and they were little at the time. And my wife and I was covered in white dust. And uh, I took my clothes off, took a shower. I watched about two minutes of TV and I just went to sleep. So that's my 9-11 story. How, did, how, thank you for telling that. This seems um, epic in the same way, maybe even possibly bigger. It's COVID-19. So, you know, I think every um, disaster, every you know, situation like this, they're all different. And, and I don't really think you can compare one to another. Like Pearl Harbor uh, can't be compared to the World Trade Center. and COVID-19 can't be compared to Pearl Harbor. Um, this particular instance uh, of the virus, um, sadly, is going to be here much longer and the patient count is much higher than uh, you know the World Trade Center and Pearl Harbor where people will still continue to get sick after tomorrow after you know so a week has gone by two weeks have gone by and you know projecting into the next week or two people are still going to get sick you're still going to die and I think that's what's really frightening. And, and you know, we can guess, and, and I think the authorities might be able to pinpoint this certainly much better than I can, because I cannot. Um, but what frightens me is that we don't know, or I don't know, when this is going to end. So, you know, when is our life going to be able to get back to normal? We want normalcy. I mean, when you think about the economy and it's coming to a standstill, for the most part, and you know, the government says, "Well, we're going to give a stimulus. We're going to help out here. We're going to give people checks there." We don't. I mean, for me personally, I don't want that. I want to go back to work. I want to get my life back to normal. Uh, I, I really don't want a handout. I want to make my own living and uh, go back to work and do the things that I love to do. So that's that's really, I think, what's different about this particular situation. Um, the desire to go back to normalcy. But yes, you're right, this is um, something of a magnitude that is certainly different and a lot scarier to some degree, because uh, it will be with us. 
And, you know, certainly the World Trade Center, the economic uh, consequences of that were with us for quite some time as well. So what do you tell your colleagues in the unit about the long haul of this? Well, we, you know, fortunately we have a lot of members and we don't want them to get burned out. So we deliberately, um, you know, try to keep them, um, we don't want them to do 16 hours at a time. We want them to have a day off in between. We don't want them to get burned out. So we stagger them. And as much as they are very willing to perform for 16 hours and come back the next day, with little to no rest, we won't allow it. So we want to preserve them. We want them to go home, get some rest, get something to eat, take it easy, take off, take a day off before they come back. They need to preserve their energy. They need to keep their resistance up. Um, they need to take care of themselves. You know, in EMS, we have a, a saying that you know you have to take care of number one, then you have to, which is yourself. You have to take care of your partner, and then you have to take care of your patient. So certainly you always, always have to take care of yourself. Because then if you don't, you can't take care of anybody. Exactly. Well, I wanna thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy, you know, there's a lot going on and your, your service to the community is outstanding as is your wife, your wife. She's incident commander for the VNA, right? Isn't that true? We're visiting Nurse Service of New York. Yes, incident commander. She's doing a great job protecting um, the elderly of New York, the most defenseless populations of, uh, of the city. Yes, and oh, by the way, I just have to mention that our service is free. It's been free since 1975 to all of our patients. So you don't get a bill once you've been delivered to the hospital? Absolutely not, totally free. And, and you know, for some people that really makes a difference uh, whether or not they're gonna go to the hospital because they're scared. They said, no, I'm not going with you, I'll, you know, just going to go home because I don't want to have to pay for a bill. It's no, no, we're free. It's, you know, you don't have to worry about a bill from us because, um, you know, ambulance bills sometimes average out to be over a thousand dollars, you know, it's expensive to take an ambulance uh, ride. And is that because you're funded by c contributions and volunteer labor? Well, the, the volunteer labor certainly helps. I mean, uh, yes, we are funded by donations. We exist solely on the account of uh, the generosity of others. Um, we don't receive any government funding. So yes, we exist on the generosity of people um, who you know, make nice donations to us. We get a lot of little donations, which make a huge difference for us. Um, and, and yes, that's, that's entirely true. I want to thank you so much, Ray, for being with us. It's just a pleasure to see you, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Great seeing you as well. All the best. Same to you. Okay, bye-bye.